Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so today we have a very special guest, a friend of the briefing room, uh, returning today. You all know National Economic Council Director Brian Deese. Brian is joining us to give some brief comments and answer some questions on the president's actions today to respond to Putin's price hike by increasing the supply of oil and achieving lasting American energy independence. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who's going to make some comments, and then we'll take some of your questions. Thank you, Kate. It's fun to say thank you, Kate. Uh, so um, I just wanted to give a little bit of additional background on uh, a couple of the elements of what the President announced today, and then happy to take your questions. Uh, the first uh, is on the release of the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, as you all um, just heard from the President, uh, he today authorized uh, the largest release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in American history, uh, one million barrels a day for uh, six months. And I just want to give you a little bit of context. First, uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve itself uh, is our national asset to deal with emergency supply disruptions uh, in energy markets. Uh, there's currently 568 million barrels uh, in the reserve, uh, which is actually in four locations across uh, southern Louisiana and Texas. Um, and the President uh, authorized this reserve under his uh, extraordinary emergency powers associated with supply disruptions, uh, which have we, we have seen uh, in the market are uh, associated with Putin's um, unjustified actions and the reaction from the United States uh, and uh, allies in the world uh, in no longer uh, purchasing Russian uh, oil. Um, the scale of the release is unprecedented, so a million uh, barrels a day, uh, and uh, the duration is also unprecedented, uh, six months. The duration is, was really designed and calibrated to operate as a bridge, a uh, medium-term bridge, to the period where we anticipate and expect U.S. production to come back online. Uh, the, most estimates based on uh, commit commitments by companies are that we will see an additional million barrels a day from U.S. industry by about the end of the third quarter of this year. So this, the time period operates as a bridge uh, until then. Uh, and the amount, a million barrels today, is, is unprecedented but feasible based on the technical capabilities of uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve itself. Um, we also know there is significant demand in the market. Uh, we are operating in a supply-constrained uh, market. That is the core challenge that is addressed, that is uh, driven prices up. Uh, but we saw, for example, the last uh, um, uh, the last sale that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve conducted was oversubscribed uh, by about two and a half times. Uh, so there is demand out there in the market. Um, the last thing that I would say is that uh, a very important element of the President's uh, announcement today was that the President authorized the sale, uh, but also the commitment to repurchase oil. Uh, and that will happen in coming years um, at a lower price. Um, and that's important for two reasons. One is yeah, it provides that bridge to uh, during this period of extraordinary supply constraint. Um, but it also provides stability to the market in the future that there will be a buyer uh, to purchase uh, oil uh, at a lower price. And it also allows us to actually maintain and increase the resilience of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve over the long term. We will be refilling uh, the reserve, and if we're buying at a lower price, we'll actually be in a position to refill at a, uh, more barrels, ultimately. So uh, the current uh, 568 million barrels will come down, but then we'll go back up, and that's how the reserve functions. Um, secondly, just briefly, I wanted to touch on the presidential directive that uh, the president signed today uh, authorizing the Defense Production Act uh, for usage for the critical materials that go into large capacity uh, batteries. So uh, the president took this action under Title III of the Defense Production Act, which uh, provides for um, prioritizing and subsidizing the production domestically of key inputs that are critical to the national defense. So the Secretary of Defense has undertaken a study um, and identified that large capacity batteries are critical to the national defense and the components that go into them, um, including lith lithium and nickel, uh, cobalt, graphite, uh, manganese, 
My guess is that's the first time in the White House briefing room someone has said manganese. Um, uh, these are critical minerals, and we are currently uh, vulnerable to unreliable supply chains, uh, which affects our national security. It also affects our economic security as well. So taking, uh, we, by taking this action, the President is authorizing uh, the government to use the DPA authorities to build domestic production capability in these key materials. And this is going to be a key driver for building a domestically resilient supply chain to build large capacity batteries. Those are the batteries that go into electric vehicles, but also used for storage um, in other applications. And also to accelerate uh, what the President talked about today of how we move to true energy independence by reducing our dependence on oil. Uh, the amount of oil that we consume uh, and reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. So um, those are uh, those are two. We, uh, the President touched on other issues as well. I'm happy to take questions all about, but I wanted to put a little bit more context on those two. Great. We'll start with Chris. Great. Hey, thank you. Um, two questions, Brian. Thank you for being here. Um, one, to the figure one million barrels per day, to the skepticism that that sounds unrealistic. Why should Americans have confidence that you're going to be able to meet that benchmark on a daily basis? And when can Americans expect to actually see the price of gas come down? So on the first one, the Department of Energy Strategic Petroleum Reserve have now committed, uh, per the President's direction, to release a million barrels a day into the market. Uh, number one, we have the full operational capacity to do that. As I mentioned, there are actually four locations that make up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. For purposes of this release, we will be releasing from all four of those uh, locations. If you look at the actual operational capacity across all four of them, it is actually up to four million barrels a day in operational capacity. So uh, actually executing a million barrels a day is well within the operational constraints. Um, and uh, a big part of that is because a lot of that moves by pipeline and so uh, they, to established um, offtake points. That's point number one. Point number two, there's been some question about well, will there be sufficient market interest or sufficient uh, demand, uh, including on the transport side. And I would say there that the, most, the, the best indicator is what just happened in the market when in the last, uh, the last sale that uh, the, the SPR tendered was two and a half times oversubscribed. Uh, so certainly there is significant demand in the market and that you would expect because uh, supply is constrained uh, and prices are high. So, uh, so we fully expect that the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve will execute against this per the President's direction. Uh, to your question about the timing of, of, of the impact, um, I've already seen, and as we came in here, you know, um, oil's trading down about 6% uh, today. But the way that we think about this is in terms of supply and the market constraint. And so the, the supply in the global market, obviously the price of oil is set at the global, at the margin, the global market, the global supply is down uh, because of uh, Russian oil. The million barrels a day plus what our allies and partners uh, are uh, uh, intending to deliver, and there's an, uh, there is a meeting tomorrow morning of the International a uh, Energy Agency in Paris, an emergency meeting, uh, and I won't get ahead of the specific commitments in that context, but as the President said, we're confident that our allies and partners will uh, provide tens of uh, millions of barrels additional into the market. So we're looking at well in excess of a million barrels a day of additional supply onto the market for, an Im uh, importantly, n uh, for several months, that that is the most um, ambitious, aggressive, historic effort to try to replace supply in the short term. So certainly there is uncertainty about pricing and, and, and lots of different factors uh, affect uh, uh, price across time. But we, uh, we are confident that this is about the largest uh, effort that oil, that uh, countries with oil reserves have ever taken to supply the market in this so way. Could prices come down in a matter of days or weeks? I know it's difficult to pinpoint, but just for Americans who budget um, based on how much they have to spend on gasoline, what should they be bracing for? Well, the, as the, the, the President uh, spoke to today, um, that is uncertain, and so, you know, in being, uh, being very clear, um, the, the market price is impossible uh, to predict with certainty. One thing that I will say for sure is that as the price of oil comes down, it's incredibly important that the, uh, that flows through to the consumer in terms of the price of gas as quickly as feasible. We've seen that be a problem uh, in the past and is definitely an issue that we are focused on. 
Justin. Hey, Brian. I, I had two. One is to follow on, I think, what you just said, which is um, you've identified there's been a problem between crude oil prices and what folks are paying at the pump and laid some of the blame for that at, at oil companies in the past, the present today, and its remarks. Um, spoke to some extent about how there were good actors and bad actors uh, in, in terms of folks who are ramping up production right now versus folks who are sort of banking profit. So I wanted to give you an opportunity for Americans who want to do the patriotic thing, where should they be going to buy their gas right now? Are there, are there good companies that have worked with the administration and folks that you're frustrated with right now? And then my other question was on your former friends kind of in the <coughs> green community that have expressed, I think, um, some level of frustration with the announcement today, feeling like it's doubling down on um, fossil fuels. Uh, obviously, I know you've kind of made this argument that long term you're trying to pivot towards green energy, especially with the second part of the announcement today. Uh, but what, what do you say to, to climate activists who are, are sort of frustrated right now? Great. So uh, on, the first, uh, on the first part of the question, uh, I would say our goal is to provide relief uh, to all Americans in all geographies across the country. Uh, and that means doing everything we can to bring down the price of gas at the pump everywhere. Uh, and so that's our, uh, that's our uh, focus. And the issue of the prices uh, of gas going up very quickly and tracking oil prices and coming down uh, much more slowly uh, is not new. Um, it's old enough that economists have a particular term uh, associated with it called rockets and feathers. But it, just because we can identify it doesn't mean that it, it, is, um, it's, uh, it reflects an efficient market or a competitive market. So that, that, has, been, that has been our focus. Uh, on your, your second question, I, I want to be really clear, and I think the president, you know, the president said this better uh, today, but I, I would just underscore it. The circumstances uh, in global oil markets today and global energy markets today provide the clearest possible signal why the United States needs to do everything it can to accelerate toward energy security and true energy independence. And the only way that we can ultimately do that is to reduce and eliminate our dependence on uh, on uh, fossil fuels. That's what the president was clear about today, and that, in fact, in the very near term, making sure that we have adequate supply is critically important for American families who are suffering. Uh, but the opportunity to actually work in partnership with our European allies, for example, to help them reduce their own dependence by reducing uh, demand uh, for uh, fossil energy, by moving forward on the plan that the president underscored today, we have a historic opportunity to do that, and we are wasting no time, and we are taking no, um, this is not causing us to do anything but, but move even more quickly in the steps that we, uh, we can take. I think the message that we have is that not only, not only can we uh, do these things uh, together, but we have to do these things together. Alice? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow up about the uh, allies and partners who would be participating. Can you give any additional detail? Will China be participating in the oil release? So I don't want to get ahead of uh, any specific uh, commitments, but I'll say a couple of things. The first is that as with uh, every action that we have taken uh, in relation to the war in Ukraine, uh, the President and our entire team have been consulting and working incredibly closely with allies and partners on this. This was a significant topic in the President's call with the Quint on Monday at the leader level. Our teams have been working around the clock together before going into that um, and in the period since. The um, IEA is uh, the body of, of countries that have significant stocks and reserves, and the formal process that they under that they go into and the United States is a, is a is a member of the IEA is to bring forward a proposal for a collective release and the the decision is whether there is a collective release and then uh, how much each country will uh, uh, contribute into that. So that's the process that will, uh, that will happen starting tomorrow morning. Um, I don't want to get ahead of it. The only thing that I would say, and I think this is probably implicit uh, in what we, what we have done here, is we, the United States and the President, made an explicit decision that the, the United States would lead here and lead with a historic use of our reserves. We have those reserves. We have the capability to do that. 
And so uh, that, was a, that was an explicit decision. At the same time, looking to partner with allies. And I think we all see that um, reflected over the course of the next couple of days. EA members are the only ones participating in the release. Is that accurate? Well, what I can tell you is that the IEA, the the meeting tomorrow will be of IEA, men or, uh, uh, of IEA members, uh, and that will be the question will be uh, about a collective release in that context. We continue to engage with non uh, IEA members, China and other countries around uh, their uh, reserves, and we'll continue to do so. But the immediate uh, the uh, the immediate step at hand will be the IEA. The president said gas might drop between sorry, 10 and sorry, 35 sorry. cents Office. a gallon. Brian, does that sound about right to you? 10 and 35 cents a gallon? Does that sound about right? That's what President Biden said. So, 10 and 35 so, cents? Uh, yeah, the president had discussions with leaders in the oil industry ahead of this announcement. What, if any, assurances were given about increasing production? Were there any guarantees made? So what what uh, what uh, what what we have engaged with oil companies uh, and energy companies on, they have been public about. So uh, we, you can see the reason why the market expectation has now increased to an expectation of about a million barrels a day of additional production online is because many of those companies have have gone out and been quite explicit about their intention to ramp up uh, production across time, and that's an outgrowth of the of a number of the conversations uh, that we have had, and so. The use or lose it uh, approach is 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 consistent in the sense that those companies that are looking to ramp production or to bring back online shuttered wells, uh, those permitted areas would would obviously be unaffected. Okay, I'm sorry, Brian. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I, as I said, it's on. Un, it's uncertain, and so I'll, I'll let the president. So, 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 so,
as citizens and as taxpayers. And so the way the process works is that companies lease tracts of land. They then, where in areas where they are more interested in potentially discovering, they then seek a permit within their leased areas. Uh, and so the way that this policy would operate would be to say going forward, in those areas where you are holding leased land, but you are not exploring, then you, um, then you would pay uh, incrementally on that. I would say two things. One is, when companies lease, the lease with the federal government, again, this is companies operating with the federal government on public land, the lease is to explore and to pursue uh, production. The, the, that, that's, that's the stated, that those are the stated lease terms. So it is, it's appropriate for uh, the federal, and uh, number two, companies can always uh, rescind their leases or transfer their leases as well. So they can, they, can, they can provide their leases back to the federal government if they no longer have any use for them, uh, or they could transfer them uh, as well. So this is really about a very practical issue, which is everybody, Republicans, Democrats, uh, everyone is saying, we need to figure out how to increase more supply. Uh, and so in those areas where we already know the, the leases have occurred, the permits have occurred, there's nothing more that needs to happen, we should be encouraging companies to operate. Um, and if they don't intend to or they don't, uh, they, don't, they don't want to, then they could hand those leases back to the government. Are you still concerned that gas prices could hit record highs this spring and this summer? So uh, the, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to predict uh, where, the, uh, where the market will go. Uh, you'll, you'll find me uh, not predicting on any particular uh, forward, um, uh, forward data point. What I will say is that because of the President's actions today, because of a historic effort to put a million barrels a day of supply into the market, and because of the effort to work with allies and partners and galvanize a global response on this front, the market will be significantly more well supplied and prices will be lower than if uh, we didn't take this historic action. And that's, you know, that's what our focus is, actions that we can take to make sure that um, the that prices come down as much as we can. Brian, one on food security real quick. Do you have any updates on the President's efforts to prevent real food shortages sparked by the war? So we are, uh, it's a, a issue of a top focus, and we will have more to say uh, on that issue in the coming days, but I, I don't have a specific announcement for you today. Um, only incrementally raising production? I think it's the same answer as the, the, the question earlier. We're, we're continuing to have those conversations, but I don't have anything new hey, for you today. You have a president who you have a president who's doing everything that he possibly can to try to address that situation, including, uh, I would say, the president announced today, and I would encourage you all to uh, to, uh, to really cover it and look into it, $3.2 million through the weatherization program that goes directly to low-income families. Low-income family could get a $6,500 grant to make their home more energy efficient, bring down their energy costs by uh, hundreds of dollars a year, and uh, improve the health uh, of their home. That's something the President did this week, uh, putting that money uh, out uh, in addition to the other issues that we discussed today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you all very much. So if you will uh, just indulge me for a minute, I have a few announcements I'd like to make uh, at the top here, so just bear with me. Um, so uh, today we're marking transgender, uh, the Transgender Day of Visibility by celebrating transgender Americans who are thriving and making their communities stronger. Unfortunately, transgender Americans, particularly children, continue to face unacceptably high levels of bullying and discrimination. As you know, the President signed one of the most comprehensive executive orders on LGBTQI plus rights in history shortly after taking office, and this administration has repeatedly and forcefully called out state legislatures that are advancing legislation that discriminates against trans children and their families. Today, the State Department and Department of Homeland Security announced new steps that will improve the travel experience for transgender Americans. And the Department of Health and Human Services has released new resources for transgender kids and their families to help protect their mental health and ensure they receive the care they need to thrive. Finally, the President is reiterating his call for the Senate to pass the Equality Act to provide long overdue civil rights pr protections to transgender and LGBTQI plus Americans. As the President told transgender Americans in his State of the Union address, this administration will always have your back so you can be yourself and reach your God-given potential. Today we're also celebrating the life and legacy of Cesar Estrada Chavez, a champion for social justice, an advocate for farm workers and working people who build and sustain our nation. 
a leader who has inspired generations of people to fight, organize, and expand opportunities for workers. When President Biden became president, he placed a bust of Cesar Chavez in the Oval Office as a reminder of the values and his vision to fight for respect, social justice, and equal dignity for all workers. The Biden-Harris administration remains committed to building an economy from the bottom up and the middle out that works for all. We fought hard to pass the American Rescue Plan that helped Latino workers, families, and small businesses to ensure that they had the support they needed through the pandemic. And we created a historic task force on worker organizing and empowerment to help workers to organize to provide an earned pathway to citizenship. Today, we join people across the country celebrating and honoring Cesar Chavez's legacy while we continue to advance the rights and dignity of working people. Today, new CDC data further underscored the mental health impact of the pandemic, including the fact that nearly half of high schoolers reported that they felt persistently sad or hopeless during the past year. As a mother of young kids, I know this is a huge concern for so many parents. The president has been acutely aware of the mental health impact of the pandemic on young people, which is why he made it a day one priority to get schools reopened safely and secure much needed resources through the American Rescue Plan to address youth mental health, a bill which every single Republican, I would note, voted against. We've invested five and a half billion dollars in programs that support mental health and well-being, including tens of millions for programs that specifically address youth mental health. For instance, Schools across the country are using American Rescue Plan funds to hire school counselors and social workers to address this crisis. According to this new CDC data, the very kind of connection that helps protect youth mental health. President Biden remains deeply focused on this very real crisis and providing the resources to address it. As part of the unity agenda that he laid out during the State of the Union address and his budget, the President put forward a historic increase in funding to strengthen and expand youth mental health services. And we're going to continue to build on this progress and do everything we can to support the mental health and well-being of our young people. And then lastly, but certainly not least, today we announced additional sanctions on Russian technology companies that enable Putin's war of choice. We will prevent them from procuring Western technology and evading our severe sanctions. We're also expanding our sanctions authority to target additional sectors of the Russian economy important to Putin, including aerospace, maritime, and the electronic sectors. In the coming days, the Commerce Department will also take further action to degrade Russia's defense, aerospace, and maritime sectors by adding 120 entities in Russia and Belarus to the entity list, bringing the number of Russian and Belarusian parties uh, added to the list to over 200 since the invasion began. Being added to this list means that these entities can no longer get U.S. cutting-edge technology without a license, which will, which will, in most, if not all of these cases, be denied. Compared to the same time period last year, U.S. exports to Russia of items subject to our new export controls have decreased by 99 percent by value. The power of these restrictions will compound over time as Russia draws down any remaining stockpiles, for example, spare parts for certain planes and tanks. We will continue to impose unprecedented costs, strengthen Ukraine's hand, and make Putin's war of choice a strategic failure. So thanks for hanging with me. I told you how to let. And I'm happy to take questions. Darlene? Thanks, Kate. Uh, a couple on Russia. Can you elaborate first on the President's comment a, a, a while ago that there is some indication that Putin has either fired some of his uh, top officials or put some of them under house arrest? What, what evidence or information does the White House have? Well, uh, the President's words on that speak for, them, for themselves. I don't have uh, a lot to add by the way of detail. What I would point to is uh, certainly information that we made public yesterday. Uh, about uh, uh, Putin and his military. Um, you know, I think writ large, we have seen uh, that this uh, invasion has been a strategic failure uh, for Putin and for Russia. They are uh, working to redefine uh, the intentional, the, in, the um, uh, initial, I should say, the initial aims uh, of their invasion. Uh, and, and we've seen time and again that the sanctions that have been applied uh, are providing, uh, are exacting extreme costs on their economy. So. Uh, I don't have anything to add to what the President said, except to say uh, we have seen uh, incontrovertible evidence that this has been a strategic disaster for Russia. And the second question is, the United States and the UK have been working together to release intelligence information since before Russia invaded Ukraine. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the value of that relationship and how the White House thinks it's affected Putin's conduct in the war, releasing, releasing that kind of information. Well, I can't speak to how it has impacted uh, Putin's conduct. That's, again, as I said yesterday, I'm not a spokesperson for the Kremlin. Uh, what I can say, though, is uh, that we've made uh, every effort to be uh, transparent, uh, even from the time uh, before Putin invaded. 
Uh, we worked to make sure that we were providing uh, information that uh, gave a sense of uh, what we knew Russia was going to do. Um, I think it, you know, to call them out in that way and to be clear uh, that we knew what their intentions were um, uh, had the impact of putting them on their back foot. I can't, again, I can't speak to how that's impacted their calculus. That's for them to say. Um, but I think we've seen writ large that the, uh, the invasion has been a strategic error, is leaving Russia weaker. Putin himself has said that the sanctions have uh, imposed unprecedented costs on the Russian economy. And our role in this, uh, our role is to continue to strengthen Ukraine on the battlefield, as we've been doing with an unprecedented amount of security assistance, uh, and to continue to strengthen their hand at the negotiating table. And, and then just one more quickly, but going back to the information that you mentioned you all released yesterday, is that some sort of an attempt to um, sow division among the Russian leadership? And if so, does the White House think that is working? It is simply an effort to continue to paint the picture of what a strategic blunder this decision has been uh, for Vladimir Putin. Uh, on that, it, it seems you're releasing even more information today. A U.S. official says you have information that indicates that some Russian government senior officials likely disagreed with Putin's decision to invade Ukraine, that their disillusionment is probably amplified by, by Russia's military underperformance. Is it your understanding that, that, that Putin is losing the support of some of his top officials? And, and why release this as well? Well, again, I, I don't have anything further to add uh, to the specifics there. I, I can only speak to uh, what this underscores, which is the larger sense that this has been a failure for Russia. Uh, you know, I think we've seen reporting uh, that morale amongst uh, the Russian military is low, and I think that would not come as a surprise to anyone who's seen uh, what the Rus Russian military is uh, is enduring here. You have conscripts, you have people who've been uh, brought in uh, to fight this incredibly grueling battle. So I don't think it's a surprise to anybody um, that morale is low. But beyond that, I, I don't have anything specific that I can add. But Mike? On oh. the president's comments about you know people being put under, under house arrest or arrested, can you say, is it your understanding that those who are, who are being arrested under house arrest are ones who sort of broke the bad news to the president about the military's performance, or are they ones who now are disagreeing with, um, uh, disagree with, with, with the, the decision to invade in the first place? I, I don't have any further additional detail that I can add. You, Mike? You keep saying, though, that, that, that you know, this is to try and uh, you know, paint a picture of Putin's strategic blunder or strategic error, but it certainly seems like you're needling and trolling Vladimir Putin here. Those are your words, not ours. I, we have been very clear that we are, uh, everything that we are doing here is designed to advance uh, our ultimate strategic aim, which is strengthening, as I said, strengthening Ukraine on the battlefield, strengthening their hand at the negotiating table, giving them what they need to push back on Russian aggression. And I think it is self-evident based on uh, what we've seen since Putin invaded on February 24th, as we've seen their economy collapse, we've seen the ruble collapse. Uh, you know, the, the impact uh, of his choice uh, has been significant. And we're going to continue to advance our strategy of doing everything we can to ensure that uh, Ukraine uh, is, uh, has what they need to continue to push back on Russian aggression. Mike? Um, so this may be a little late, late breaking, I don't know, but there have been reports uh, in the last hour or so about um, concerns at Chernobyl with Russian uh, with Russians leaving the nuclear plant because of some kind of exposure. Do you have any, um, does the U.S. government have any information about what might be going on there and whether, uh, sort of how, how broad the danger is there? I have not seen that since we came into this room, but I'm happy to go look into it and we can come back to you with answers. Yeah. Hey, on, uh, on COVID, I wonder if you can comment on reports that there's an agreement in principle for $10 billion in additional COVID aid. I think Senator Romney talked about it earlier today. So as we talked about yesterday, uh, we are obviously very hopeful that Congress is making progress uh, as we need to get this urgent funding uh, that we need to fight COVID-19. Uh, the president has been very clear. There is an, uh, a strong sense of urgency here. Uh, you know, you heard him say yesterday that Congress's failure to act is already having severe consequences, including on our supply of monoclonal antibodies and treatments for the immunocompromised. So these are, as you note, uh, ongoing uh, active negotiations on this. And so we're certainly not going to uh, negotiate from the podium. But I will say that the president has been very clear that uh, there's an urgent need for this funding, and we're very hopeful that Congress is going to come to a solution on this. One, one more do sure. one follow on that. I sure. think the plan calls for slashing some of the foreign aid. Um, you know, Biden has said repeatedly that we can't just you know take care of ourselves; that we have to you know the the, the, the 
pandemic isn't going to stop, there's no, no wall we can build, would he sign a bill or would he veto a bill that doesn't include significant foreign aid? Well, what I would say to this is uh, we have been very clear and the president has been very clear, both publicly and in private, uh, about the acute need for funding of our global response for weeks, if not months. Uh, and in the past day, our position has been very clear about the importance here. Right now, countries, in fact, are declining our doses because they don't have the infrastructure in place to take our life-saving vaccines. Funding will obviously help solve this issue. And I actually want to read to you a letter to the president signed by 14 U.S. senators, half of whom are Republicans. Quote, we urge you in the strongest possible terms to do more to lead global efforts to end this pandemic and increase global vaccine access. So we hope that these senators will follow their own advice and provide resources for the global response because now is the time to act. And we're not going to be able to put this pandemic behind us until we stop the spread and proliferation of new variants globally. So uh, the president has been very clear. He believes this funding is important. But again, we're going to let Congress work through and we're very hopeful that they are going to come to a, a solution. Okay. Thanks, Kate. I want to ask you uh, again about the president's comments today when he was asked about the information that Putin is being left in the dark by his advisors. He seemed much less confident in the intelligence than you were from the podium and other top officials here. When he was asked about it today, he said it's an open question. There's a lot of speculation. Um, he seems to be self-isolating. He said, but we don't have hard evidence. You said from the podium, we have information that Putin felt misled by the Russian military. Why the disconnect? I don't see a disconnect there. We were clear yesterday that we shared a piece of information that helps paint a picture about how this has been a strategic failure for Russia. The president there, said there's a lot of speculation. He didn't say we have hard evidence, we're confident. And there's, there is plenty of discussion. And that's part of what we did yesterday, was put additional information into the public sphere, into the conversation. I don't think there's a disconnect between those two things. The president was uh, making statements about uh, about uh, uh, where uh, things currently stand, where he understands things to currently stand. I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's in any way uh, at odds with what we said yesterday. Well, is the administration confident that Putin is being left in the dark by his top advisors? You stand by everything you said from the president. We put forward information yesterday, and I think you can draw the appropriate conclusion from that. Uh, we would not put it forward uh, if we didn't have confidence in it. One more on Hunter Biden, who has been uh, in the headlines again recently. During the last presidential debate, then Vice President Biden was asked if there was anything inappropriate or unethical about his son's relationships, business dealings in China and or Ukraine. The president said nothing was unethical. He went on to say, my son has not made money in terms of this thing about what you're talking about, China. Does the White House stand by that comment that the then Vice President made? We absolutely stand by the President's comment. And I would point you to uh, the reporting on this, which referenced statements that we made at the time uh, that we gave to The Washington Post, who worked <clears throat> on this story. Uh, and But as you know, I don't speak for Hunter Biden, so there's not more I can say on that. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Kate. Um, on releasing barrels from the Strategic Reserve, this move does not resolve the structural deficit that we have. In the last two times the administration released barrels of oil, it didn't have a measurable impact on gas prices. So what makes this administration believe that this move is going to have an impact this time? This is, uh, as you heard Brian say, this is a historic and unprecedented uh, release in terms of size. It is going to help meet the mismatch between supply and demand in the market. A million barrels a day is a significant uh, addition to the marketplace and is going to, uh, as I say, is going to address the, some of the mismatch between uh, supply and demand. And I think what Americans should take away from this announcement today is that President Biden is relentlessly focused on doing everything he can to ensure that Putin's price hike does not hit them at the gas pump. So what they've uh, seen from him, I think, since the day he took office is a focus on uh, doing what he can to address kitchen table issues, to address the things that uh, people across the country are worried about, uh, including gas prices. And so today, you know, not only is it historic in uh, scope, but it, uh, as you heard Brian talk about, this has also been, uh, the president has led a global effort to galvanize a response to this um, because he knows that uh, rising prices at the pump hurt families and he's doing everything in his power to bring those prices down. Bring up the, this is going to bring up the, the supply in the short term, but it's not, you know, a long-term solution. And, you know, one analyst has said that 
uh, if the market maintains a structural deficit for a long period of time, releasing reserves might actually keep prices higher. So if this does not work in the way that you think it's going to work, will the administration stop releasing a million barrels a day? Uh, we will cert well. I won't, I won't speak to uh, what we might do in the hypothetical depending on uh, where the market goes. What I will say broadly is, of course, uh, we would always adjust our strategy to do uh, what is most effective to bring prices down. What I would say about the long term, to your, to your question about the long term, is, you know, and I think you heard Brian uh, articulate this really well, and of course the President uh, spoke to it very powerfully today too, which is this ultimately uh, shows that dependence on fossil fuels, dependence on foreign oil is not uh, is not in the sustainable, long-term best interest uh, of the United States. And that's why uh, the President has put forward a really uh, aggressive plan uh, to move us to uh, clean energy uh, sources of, uh, of, uh, of energy uh, that we can make here in the United States. That's part of, as you heard Brian talk about, the Defense Production Act announcement that he made today to help us make electric vehicle batteries in the United States. Uh, you know, the President feels very strongly um, that we need to move we need to make significant strides toward a clean energy economy. It's something he's been very focused on. You'll remember, for those of you who covered the campaign, it's something he ran on. Uh, and so he's very focused on uh, ensuring that we're taking those strides, because that is, that is actually the long-term solution here. On, on okay. sanctions, the, the Russian ruble has almost returned to its pre-war levels. So does the administration believe that the sanctions are still working? Uh, absolutely, uh, yes. And what I would say about, uh, what I would say about the ruble is, what we're seeing here is an artificial propping up of the ruble by the Russian central bank uh, and, by, uh, and, and by the Russian government. Um, there are uh, avenues are closed off to allow uh, the sale of rubles. They are basically taking artificial measures um, uh, to keep the ruble propped up. I would also say that in the first, uh, you know, in the first few days, in the first, I would say also in the first few days uh, after the conflict began, uh, the ruble was a reliable measure of where the Russian economy is, uh, but it is not any longer, in part because of these artificial steps that are being taken. So if you look at things like uh, dramatic inflation in Russia, you look at uh, uh, private investment pulling out of Russia, if you look at Putin himself saying that the sanctions have uh, imposed unprecedented costs, I think that's a better uh, metric of where the Russian economy is right now. Steve? Well, I'm going to follow up on Kristen's question about uh, the President's summit. Uh, is it your understanding it's the President's view that as he looks at all of Hunter Biden's business dealings with his uncle, that uh, neither Hunter Biden nor James Biden committed any crimes or did anything that was unlawful? So I don't have anything further to add from this podium. We addressed this uh, with the Washington Post. We pointed to statements uh, that were made in the fall of 2020 when we addressed these questions, and I don't have anything additional to add from this podium. Can I ask you if there have been, if you're aware, if there have been any discussions here inside this White House about whether the President might use his pardon or commutation power with respect to either his son or his brother? That's not a hypothetical I'm going to entertain. I don't have anything to add from this podium. Justin? Thanks, Kate. Um, the President met with progressive lawmakers uh, last night here at the White House, and afterwards they uh, said that they pressed him on sort of a, a laundry list of executive orders and actions that they'd like him to take, canceling student debt, raising the overtime threshold, um, prescription drug costs. Uh, are any of those sort of uh, live here in the White House right now? Are they under consideration, especially, I think, relative to this negotiation that's going on um, about elements of Build Back Better and, and whether, you know, the push and pull of those executive actions might help or hurt that, that effort? Well, I don't have any specific uh, announcements on any of those specific pieces. What I would say more broadly is that from day one, the President has used the full array of tools at his disposal to achieve his objectives, and that's included legislative action, regulatory action, and executive orders, and he will certainly continue to do so. But I don't have any specific uh, coming actions to preview for you right now. Sorry, real quick. Jordan asked you yesterday about the uh, meeting in India with senior administration officials. Mm -hmm. Wondering now that those have wrapped up, um, do you have any newfound confidence that, that India will uh, decide against maintaining oil trade with Russia or, or sense of you know what came out of the, the, the So I don't have any specific. I knew you were going to ask this, and I need to follow up with specifics because I don't have any. I don't have any uh, additional specifics to read out uh, beyond uh, the fact that they were productive conversations. Um, uh, you know, Dilip Singh, the Deputy National Security Advisor uh, for International Economics, had really good 
uh, discussions with uh, his counterparts. Um, and, uh, and I know that the conversation was productive. I don't have additional specifics to read out, but I will. And by the way, I should be clear, I meant generically, I know you will ask, not you specifically. <laughs> Three. Thanks, Kate. Um, so on the SPR, some Republicans, uh, for example, Senator Cassidy, have said that the president, with his uh, move today, uh, in terms of the unprecedented uh, drawdown of the um, SPR, that he's uh, risking long-term energy security um, to salvage poll numbers. Is that something that has um, played into the White House's calculus at all? Um, and how would you respond, uh, respond to that? Absolutely not. What the president is doing is using every tool available to him to bring prices down for the American people at the pump. Uh, he's been clear that his focus is working to relieve the pain and the burden uh, that uh, working families, middle class families, are feeling as a result of price hikes. So every policy decision that he makes is driven by a desire to do everything he can to ease that burden on on working families. Just uh, two quick uh, quick ones, following up on Kristen's line of inquiry as well. I know Hunter Biden is not a government employee. You don't speak for him. Has the president read these reports? Do you guys take them to him when the inquiries come in? And what has been his reaction to them? I don't have anything additional to add on this from the podium, but thank you. Caitlin? And, and on Title 42, uh, you're preparing to uh, end this policy at some point soon here. Um, there has been some concern expressed by Democrats, as well as Republicans, but Democrats notably, about how the administration is preparing to wind that down and prepare for a surge. Uh, I believe some administration officials say they're anticipating a record surge. Uh, what is the administration doing? Uh, to not only alleviate those concerns from moderate Democrats, some of whom may face voter ire for that, uh, but then more broadly, how is the, you know, the administration preparing for that surge, if you can sort of generally summarize it? Well, so thank you for the question. Uh, first, I would note, as I said yesterday, and we have said many, many times, obviously this is a decision that the CDC will make. Um, that said, of course, we are preparing for contingencies. Um, and so what I would say is, uh, you know, our goal is going to be to process migrants in a safe and orderly manner, but also, to be clear, most individuals who cross the border without legal authorization will be promptly placed into removal proceedings. And if they are unable to establish a legal basis to remain in the United States, they'll be expeditiously removed and returned to their country of origin. As a reminder, economic need and flight from generalized violence is not a basis for asylum, but rather asylum is for those with a well-founded fear of persecution on a protected ground. And so asylum and other legal migration pathways should remain available to those seeking protection. And we're working to expand legal pathways in the region so that people don't make this treacherous journey. Obviously, trying to enter the United States illegally carries consequences, and no one should try to make this dangerous journey or try to unlawfully enter the United States. The Department of Homeland Security, as I noted yesterday, uh, put together a preparedness plan to address the number of people coming to our border uh, and work with our partners in the region to provide safe options for people outside the United States. We are uh, obviously working to deliver a more efficient and fair uh, processing system through, for example, a dedicated docket to conduct speedier and fair immigration proceedings for families who arrive between ports of entry. So there is a, a significant amount of work we obviously inherited when we came into this uh, administration. We inherited an immigration system that had been systematically uh, dismantled by the previous administration. There's been a tremendous amount of work from day one uh, to rebuild that. Uh, and we are certainly focused on uh, continuing to uh, assert order at the border. Okay. One point of clarification, when the president says he believes Putin is firing or putting senior advisors on house arrest, he's talking about military advisors, right? No, I have nothing additional I can add beyond the president's comments on this. You can't say that he's referencing the Russian foreign minister? I think his words speak for him, speak for themselves. Thank you. Okay. Alex? No, no, sorry, I've got one more. Sure. Um, president Biden has not spoken to President Putin in quite some time. Are there any plans being made for the two of them to speak? Not currently. Uh, we've been very clear that uh, any, in, any re-engagement of diplomacy at that level would require significant uh, demonstration from the Russians of serious de-escalation, and we have not seen that. Oh, you need to see de-escalation before he'll speak to President Putin again? We've been very clear about that. 
The White House has previously considered a gas tax holiday, but basically kind of ruled against it. I'm curious if this is still off the table, uh, and what does the White House think about individual states that are considering or have already enacted uh, their own gas tax holidays? So I, it is it is not off the table. In fact, uh, the, the president is looking at uh, every option uh, to provide relief to consumers um, around uh, around gas prices. Um, obviously, a lot of these conversations are happening uh, in Congress. Um, but again, the president is not taking anything off the table uh, at this stage. So. Okay. Do Alex? countries have uh, rejected Putin's demand to pay for gas in rubles? Does the U.S. stand with them in rejecting that as well? Uh, we do, and uh, the German Chancellor, I think, has been very clear that uh, that the contracts exist as they exist, and there's going to be no change there. My question, a question of a colleague that who cannot be here. My question is uh, uh, on, again on allies and partners in the oil reserves. The president uh, referred to 30 to 50 billion barrels. Uh, Brian didn't want to name any countries, but where did he get this number? And Canada being the main exporter of oil to the U.S., has, it, they, has the country been solicited? Our neighbor. Well, I can't speak to specific uh, bilateral engagements, but I would note that obviously the president discussed this, uh, the G7, uh, when he was in Europe last week. This is a continuing, ongoing conversation with our allies and partners. It is a key priority maintaining the stability in our energy markets. So, um, yeah, you know, those conversations are ongoing, and we obviously consult very closely with our allies and partners. And the question from, uh, sorry, the, from the colleague, sorry, sorry, from the colleague who cannot be here. It's about the Prime Minister of Pakistan accused the U.S. of. Uh, working with the opposition to remove him from power. You just said that today. What's the White House reaction to this? There is absolutely no truth to that allegation. Thanks, Kate. Um, to go back to the COVID deal, I know you say you're not going to negotiate from the podium. And the president has obviously warned about the severe consequences if there is no funding. But if there is a $10 billion deal, which some of the top negotiators say they're getting close to, what would the administration then be able to cover? That long list the president th went through yesterday of everything that stops over the coming months, what is saved over the coming months, and what is still then at risk? Well, obviously, the specifics of this deal are continuing to be worked out. So I don't have a breakdown for you of exactly where that funding would go. This is a live negotiation. Um, and again, obviously, we're not going to negotiate from here, except to say broadly that this is incredibly an incredibly urgent need. Uh, and we really hope that the Congress is, is coming to a solution is on this. Is top priority that you say that is the must thing we have to fund over the next couple of months? I'm not going to lay that out as the negotiation is happening. Obviously, this is being worked through on Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that they are going to come to a solution soon. Okay. Uh, yeah, Kate, I wanted to ask about the use it or use it policy that the president has today. Uh, it requires uh, congressional approval. Uh, and O'Brien was briefly asked about this, but I just wanted to clarify. I mean, has the White House prepared legislation on this? Uh, does it have support lined up in Congress? And what is the timeline you're hoping to pass this measure? And is it really even realistic uh, in an evenly divided Senate right now with uh, midterms coming up in the fall? Well, uh, you know, the proposal would actually build on uh, the version that's uh, in the House bill. So there's a version of this okay. that is already, yep, there's a version of this that's already been put forward. Uh, obviously, the President looks forward to working with Congress on it. He believes uh, it's, it's a critically important piece of helping to move our uh, energy dependence from overseas back home and, and to move us toward a clean energy economy. So we intend to work very closely with Congress. Uh, this will be a priority for the president. Um, but I in terms of a specific timeline, I, I don't have any for anything so further on that. With that House bill, or you're, you say you're building on that, what does that look like? We, that will be an ongoing negotiation. We will continue to build on it. That's a discussion that we'll have with Congress. Obviously, uh, this announcement just came today, so uh, that work will be ongoing. Okay. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Do you take any responsibility in the President by the approval numbers?